Welcome to this week's edition of the Accounting Influencers Podcast. I'm Rob Brown, and I bring to you every week experts from all over the world that speak with authority into the world of accounting and finance and the technology that goes with it. I'm exactly. built out with me today a true expert in the FP&A world. It's Paul Barnhurst. Good day, sir. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here, Rob. Paul, let's start right from the beginning. For accountants listening that haven't come across the phrase FP&A, and you are the FP&A guy, just describe what it means and, and the definition of it, a little bit of context. Well, you know, first I'll tell the joke of how I describe it that gets me in trouble. Then we'll <laughs> talk about the real definition. So, yeah, I always say, what's the difference between an accountant and an FP&A professional? When an accountant gets creative, they go to jail. When an FP&A professional gets creative, they get promoted. Wow. I like that. <laughs> you know, tongue in cheek, obviously, but I mean, the I think the easiest way to look at it is, you know, accounting is about the historical records primarily right. and about making sure the books are accurate. FP&A is about how we're going to best spend that next dollar and helping the business budget and forecast those resources. So taking that historical financial data with the operational data and helping bring that finance lens to the strategy and how the business moves forward through forecasting, budgeting, ad hoc analysis, you know, partnering with the business, management reporting, board deck is often done by FP&A in conjunction with the CFO. So those are the common tasks and where the difference is. But in reality, you know, I joke about the difference between accounting and FP&A, but as I like to say, FP&A's best friend is a good accountant. Right. Because if the books are wrong and they don't know what's going on and journal entries are being booked incorrectly, it's a nightmare to try to, you know, make sense of your forecast versus actuals and even your forward-looking numbers. Yeah. So just to be clear, Paul, for people that don't know, FP&A stands for what? Oh, great. Yes. Financial planning and analysis. Right. What's the difference between FP&A and, say, a CFO or a finance director or a specialist tax advisor? Yeah. So, I mean, first on, you know, FP&A, rarely do you get into tax, right? You're really just looking at the financials going forward. So you're definitely not a tax expert. As for yep. the difference from a CFO, I look at the CFO, they're really managing that relationship with the CEO and all the senior level. FP&A, sometimes they may be managing just one business. They may be a, so there's a couple different types of FP&A. You have what you call business unit FP&A. Sometimes you'll hear it called business partnership in some parts of the world or business partner, but that's really your, where you're working with the general manager. So like say a large company, American Express, I was there. I supported a VP of a certain area within a business. And I did the forecasting forum for multiple countries. And so as business unit, then there's corporate level support where really you're rolling everything up, especially in a big company. So you're much more working with the CFO in that case, you know, maybe the CEO, help with the board, the board decks, all those type of things. So in big companies, you have different types of FP&A. In a small company, it's one person doing all of it. And in an early stage company, sometimes they will hire a controller or a head of finance that will do both. Right. So, you know, in some areas of the world, a controller is doing FP&A, especially in small companies. So there's a little bit of overlap, sometimes CFO, like small companies, when they hire CFO advisory type services or fractional support, that CFO is often doing some of the tasks of FP&A. So there's definitely some overlap, but where I look at it, especially in the larger organization of the CFO, especially with public companies, really about managing that relationship externally and with the C-level and the board, whereas FP&A is helping with the forecast, helping implement, taking that strategy and taking that direction from the CEO, the CFO, and making sure that the budget and plan meets the needs and helping the business stay on track for financials, where the CFO may be, you know, is dealing with the accounting, the treasury, the tax, the audit, all, all those things. Yeah. Thank you for that explanation. Really helpful. So if apples grow on trees, where do FP&A professionals grow? Talk to us about how they develop their career path, their heritage, what they're really good at, Paul. Yeah. So, I mean, there, we're definitely seeing different paths now. What's interesting is we're seeing more and more FP&A people become CFOs because it's a very strategic role today. It yeah, wasn't. They are aligned. You know, I used to think of it a lot historically as I used to call it FPNR, financial planning and reporting. Right. Because just producing a ton of papers. Now there's so much more on the analysis and the strategic side. 
And so where FP&A comes from, you know, one of the most common places and a natural fit is accounting for an accountant that's really interested in learning the business and is comfortable with ambiguity. And I'll give an example there. I uh, had an accountant that was fabulous that supported me. And I asked him one day, look, I'm hiring a financial analyst. Are you interested? He's like, no, thanks. I did FP&A for a year. That's all fuzzy math. Right. Like I'm not interested. You're just making yeah. up numbers, basically. Like I like to know that my numbers right and it all balances. I'm like, all right, well, you're great at what you do, so you just stay there. I'm I'm fine with that, you know. And so that's an example of knowing what you need to be. But you get a lot from accounting. You know, some will come from MBA and a finance route. That's where I came from. I did an MBA in finance, worked in the business, and then moved into an FP&A role. And then you're seeing more today especially smaller. A lot of these startup companies are doing acquisition or a lot of funding. You see some people coming from consulting or investment banking because I think they they tend to bring a strategic lens to the FP&A that can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by, as a former high school math teacher, Paul, I, I get the numbers. I'm a part qualified accountant. I'm intrigued by the geekiness and nerdiness of financial analysis, business analysis, reporting the numbers, the spreadsheets, and that ability to tell the stories behind the numbers, which is a softer skill, it's a persuasive and influential a leadership skill. Talk to us a little bit about how those skill sets marry. Yeah, you know, it really is. It's kind of a unique position. I saw there was a study done by a professor, I want to say at Harvard or somewhere, and I would posted about it on LinkedIn. I wish I could remember his name. But he talked about the need of math and social skills yeah. for any job. And up in the right-hand corner, the highest was finance, financial manager of needing that combination, which just shows, you know, numbers aren't enough. You can be a geek and yeah, you, you, you could be an analyst, but if you want to move up, you got to have those social skills. You have to be able to tell that story and influence the business. And it's, it's really critical. I learned early in my career as I had done some, you know, number crunching and thought something was a great idea and <clears throat> had my boss's support and shared it with the business. And they're all like, this is stupid. We're not doing this basically. Or, or they just kind of humor me and it never happened. And I realized I didn't try to influence them. I just assumed because I thought it was a smart idea, they would be on board. Hmm. And it was a reminder that, you know, good ideas die all the time. And sometimes bad ideas raise to the top because you're able to influence people. There's a real skill there beyond just the analysis and just the numbers. So it was a good learning lesson of that human side of the process. Mm. And at Accounting Influences, my brand, we talk a lot about the power of influence, how it's currency, how it gets deals done, it gets decisions made. And as an FP&A professional, you don't just want to inform and educate. You want to move the dial. You want to mm -hmm. get people to first listen to what you've got to say, second, value what you've got to say, third, make decisions and take action on what you've got to say. And then fourth, be held accountable for that by you mm -hmm. so that they're implementing what needs to be done. All of that's wrapped up in the role. Exactly. Yep. And, you know, I share an example of that. I had a one business partner that I had a great relationship with, and he commented one time, he's like, you don't just report the financials, you help shape them. Right. Like you're impacting the numbers. And that was the best compliment I could receive because it meant I was making a difference. The business mm. was listening and I was a valued partner versus I've had times where in the role, okay, we have to deal with finance. We don't really want to, but all right, we'll talk to you because we know we need to. Yeah. You mentioned the term business partner. This business partnering is often misunderstood, but it's a, a very critical part of a business. Just explain that world a little bit for us, Paul. Yeah. You know, actually I was, uh, on a podcast yesterday where someone explained that relationship a little bit like when you think in a personal life, most people have a partner, right? A little bit like that. And I like the way he described it. He said, when you have a partner, your goal is to help them to be successful. Okay. You want your partner to be successful. He's like, and that's how you should treat it in a business world is that partner you work with, your goal should be able to help them be successful, help them achieve their numbers. And if you're focusing on that, and focusing on doing what's best for them and for the business, you'll be successful. So I think sometimes, you know, part people think a partner needs to always agree with the business or you're there to do their bidding. And that's not true. You still work for the CFO and, and that's who your boss is. And you're responsible to the company to ensure they're making smart decisions with their resources. And sometimes that may mean you have to tell the business that you don't think something's a good idea and here's why, but we can look at it from some other angles and here's some other thoughts about it. 
you know, you got to be real careful to not get the label of CF no that we've all heard of, right? Just <laughs> say no to everything because then, then you uh, just perpetuate that stereotype of finance versus getting the seat at the table and really being that trusted advisor that they need. Because one thing FPNA has that really nowhere else in the business has outside of the CEO is they get to see the whole business. Yeah. They get a holistic view and they get it not just from a finance lens, but they're seeing the operational metrics and the historical and the go forward. So they're really in a unique position within a business. I'm just thinking of how good a partner my wife is because she's really good, Paul, at telling me how my ideas don't work. <laughs> and, and telling me what's not going to happen and bad I'm decisions not that I'm that making. One. <laughs> Talk to us about the FPNA space, Paul. You're, you're an expert in this area. You empower finance professionals globally in this area. Is it a big community? Are there millions of you? Are they the fulcrum of business worldwide? Give us a feel for that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely not millions. I haven't been able to find a good number of how many are out there globally. Okay. I would love to see, see a number. But, you know, typically small companies, which make up the majority of companies, particularly, I'd say, under $5 million in revenue, often don't have a built out FPNA function, right? They, they want to hit some level of scale. So often an owner or somebody might be doing it. There's a finance then, function though, isn't there somewhere? Yeah, there's typically a finance. So how, I mean, right. How it typically starts is bookkeeping is the first thing you get usually outsourced. Right. Like I don't do my own bookkeeping. I did it at first and now I've hired someone to do it in QuickBooks, uh -huh. right? From my business. And over time, if I scaled big enough, then it's like, okay, you bring that in house. And then you say, okay, well, I need more help. So I'm going to go out and get either a, some kind of advisory services. Sometimes they're called FP&A. Sometimes they're a fractional CFO. You get a little overlap depending on what you need in those early days and how strategic it needs to be. And then as you, as you scale, like if you're thinking the venture capital space, which I spend a lot of time with these days with all the different tools I talk to, typically around, you know, series B, you'll, you'll have an FP&A person, you know, series C, you might add a cup, you know, have two and it kind of grows from there. But, you know, big global companies could have hundreds, yeah. if not a thousand in some cases and big shared services. So, I mean, when you think about it, there's hundreds of thousands. I wouldn't say there's millions out there in FP&A, but hundreds of thousands. How respected is the FP&A role? We recognize the C-suite. We recognize in England, we would say a, a financial director. You would maybe say CFO. We recognize designations like that. But the FPNA professional, how respected is that from the outside, Paul? So it's definitely grown a lot. COVID really accelerated FPNA, as has the uh, growth in software. So I'd say, you know, still in a lot of regions, like some places in Europe, a lot of times you hear controller and they're doing an FPNA role, or like you say, you know, finance director, sometimes the CFO. So I think it's still often misunderstood, but it's definitely growing. You know, I heard, like I said, uh, Jack McCulloch, who runs a big CFO leadership council, said three years ago, he predicted most CFOs would come from FP&A. He's like, I've been wow. a little late, but I think that's where we're heading. Mm -hmm. And so that respect is definitely growing, you know, during COVID when you needed constant forecasting and understand, can we survive? What is our cat? You're working, working with Treasury, really elevated FP&A. And now we're seeing a lot of software being built for it. That's an area I focus on pretty closely. And I have a list of over probably over, over 100 tools, almost 150 tools in the, in the space for FP&A software. So it's definitely getting more recognized and, you know, it's being elevated, but yeah, it's often misunderstood. If I tell people I'm FP&A, oh, so you do uh, personal finance. Can you give me advice on, <laughs> no, no, I have nothing to, nope. Yeah. I don't even do a good job of keeping my own budget. I'm not going to tell you how to run your numbers. Yeah. You, brought it, admit, but. you brought up the software, Paul, and I'm glad you did because there's so much going on in the the reporting accountants hold more data than anybody else with all the software that they they manage and they said there's more software in an accounting firm than and than anywhere else so the tools that are at your disposal as an fpna professional it's massive and they do a lot of the heavy lifting for you don't mm -hmm. they a lot of the grunt work but you still need to manage that software you still need to make good decisions on what software is best Talk to us through the whole technology side of this FP&A role. Yeah, so it's fascinating. So stepping back just a little bit, and I'll explain why within finance, there's a you know, big discussion going on right now, and you're seeing it more and more that the CFO is owning data. Right. I had someone on my podcast that 
they use the term that they see the CFO becoming the chief business op- business intelligence officer okay. because of the data. I've heard others say, you'll know you have a modern CFO if they own the data. And I thought that was really interesting because they realize that's the currency of today and how important it is to have a non-biased organization, one that's a support function, making sure all those operational metrics are consistent across the business. Because right churn you can define it differently and marketing might want to favor themselves or product or you know whoever and so you're definitely seeing that and so fpna is often the one who's putting together all those metrics so the amount of data they deal with is tremendous just like accounting right there's a huge amount going through finance and it's a real challenge i know and a word that's just come into my head sorry to interrupt paul no, is no, the please. guardian of the data you, you said owning the data it's the guardian it's the steward yes. of the data isn't it would that be accurate mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And I think you're seeing that in a lot of companies. You know, obviously it varies. There's always the debate, how much is IT? Does the analytics department, where does it sit? You know, it's not just like anything. It's not clear cut, but that's how I think of it. And so with that, you know, these these FP&A tools today, at a minimum, any tool of scale is going to need to integrate with your ERP, your CRM or wherever your sales data comes from, depending on the industry, but generally CRM. Uh And, you know, easily bring in HR data, whether it integrates with the system or you're bringing that in via Excel. You know, if you're a SaaS business, they often have to integrate with your billing platform. So many of them will integrate integrate with Snowflake or other, you know, data warehouse tools. And so you're bringing all that in to help, you know, model and forecast and do the reporting. And it's, you know, that's a, that's a lot of information to, to bring into one system and to keep straight. And so you're definitely seeing, you know, more and more tools try to solve it. Small companies, the tech stack is a spreadsheet, right? It's pretty simple if you're 100,000 or a million. The role of an accountant has changed over the years. And I argue this a lot with people when we talk about the relevancy of the CPA qualification or the chartered accountant's mm-hmm. qualification in that sure. it misses often a big chunk of the technology. So if you look at a modern day accounting or finance professional, they are, they don't need to write code, but they need to be quite geeky. They need to know more than how to turn a computer on and off. They need to know more than how to stick numbers in a spreadsheet and generate a formula. There is a certain amount of nerdiness or geekiness. I, I don't know how else to say that. IT fluency, if you like. It's not just knowing the numbers and being comfortable with balance sheets, is it? 100% agree. One of the best things I did for you know MicroPath, when I did my MBA in finance, I also did a Master of Science in Information Management. Right. Unfortunately, they didn't have a Master of Analytics at the time, or that's what I would have done. You know, a few years later, they all started cropping up. But uh, and that has helped me because I can speak the IT side. I've learned some SQL. You know, I've learned Power Query, and having that technical has allowed me to save hours on certain projects and be able to figure out how to do things. So I think it's really important to have, as you've called it, the geeky or the numbers, you know, background. And and today it's becoming easier. Yes, generative AI can automate a lot of that, but you still have to be able to understand: is it right? How does it impact things? And in some ways, I've heard some argue you even need a better understanding of the basics of database, of tables, maybe some of the code, so you can make sure you're maximizing the use of these tools. Is that a barrier then to accounting and finance types that get the numbers? They have the social skills to go with the narrative, but... They're not a Paul Barnhurst. They don't know SQL. They they really struggle with the code and they that really deep data side of things. I don't know that they need to go deep. I, in fact, I'd say they don't. They need basics. It can hold you back in some companies. Like I've seen some companies that are very much going, they want data science type in their FP name. Right. So yes, could it limit some roles? But if you're really good on the human side, and you're good with the numbers, I think there'll always be a place for you. There's There's enough different roles out there that I don't think you'll get eliminated. Yeah. But I do think it's good to at least invest some time so you can have intelligent conversations about it. You don't need to go deep and be, you know, a geek nerd that can write, you know, Python, which I can't, or write yeah. R or any of those things. A lot, of our, a lot of our listeners are accountants, Paul, and you'll be aware that in this complicated world that we live in and fast moving world, they are encouraged and pushed by their clients to be not just the accountant, but the trusted advisor. You mentioned that phrase earlier. Now, what's yep. involved in being in a trusted advisor is going beyond the historical, as you alluded to, to that future-focused yep. approach. 
And some accountants struggle with that because it's not how they were trained. It's not how they got into it. It's not what they want to do. So there's that whole new skill set there of being able to develop this finance function on top of the accounting function. So I'm interested in your take on the crossover with the accounting space, the finance space, the FP&A space. Can an accountant become a CFO and... If an accountant truly wants to be a, a trusted advisor, do they need to be developing these finance and FP&A skills? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. And definitely there's a lot of crossover and you can do both. You see people, sometimes they'll do it. Like I have a good friend that he was a VP in FP&A, then ran FP&A for another company. And now he's a controller again. He stepped back and is just doing an accounting role. I don't want to say step back in the sense of promotion, but just took a different path would be right. a better way to say that. And so I, I think there, you know, there's a lot of overlap for sure. And there's any good FP&A person needs a solid accounting background. So accounting is a natural place to go toward FP&A. But I think the key is they really, one, they need to have that desire to understand the business. Hmm. If you're just interested in the numbers and you really don't want to get deep and understand the business, then FP&A, CFO, those more customer facing, when I say customer, the customer is the business, those more yeah. customer facing roles are not a good fit for you. I would argue you're better staying in accounting and looking at where you can move and grow there. And then yes, you can develop those skills. And I think one of the first things it starts with, if you haven't done much forecasting is okay, take a close, take a course, learn what some of the common methods are for forecasting, top down, bottom up, a zero based budget, time series, whatever it might be, but get some basic ideas of what's commonly used, you know, learn how to build a model, a good three statement model, maybe, you know, take a course, get a certification. There's one from FMI that's out there and they do a really good job of helping certify people in that. And so get a little bit of those skills that will help you in building those forecasts and being able to think how the forward looking works. Hmm. That's a really good outline of next steps to dip your toes into this world because to stay relevant and competitive, accounting finance professionals need to be constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. You mentioned AI earlier, and I'm intrigued, Paul, as to how the emerging technologies are shaping the world you're in. Talk to us a bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, I've definitely used generative AI some. I do a lot of training, and I've trained a few people, giving them some examples of how it can be used. I use it to create dummy data all the time. I've used it to write emails. You know, so I definitely, the other day we were working on a deck and wanted to get some comparisons and so used it to help guide the comparisons for, you know, some differences between kind of where accounting was 15 years ago and where it was today. And it was really helpful. So I think, you know, the thing is, the way I look at AI is there's, there's a couple of things. One, it's going to take time. It's going to be, you know, it's not a six month or a year. It's much like the internet and cloud before everybody can use it. There's things that have to be solved. Speed of yeah. computers, bandwidth, privacy, accuracy, all those things. And so people have time to learn it. The second is how people need to look at it is a productivity tool. Just like Excel was a productivity tool. Just like computers are a productivity tool. And not to fear it, but to be willing to try it and find ways to use it and be more productive. It's going to make a lot of that technical analysis much easier. Mm. Uh, you know, I just tested out code interpreter with chat GPT-4 and I can load a file up there and it tells me all the details about the file and it writes the Python code for me. And it's really good. You know, stuff that I've heard like a, a guy who was a, had a PhD, he said, things that took me two weeks to learn in my PhD take me two seconds to do with chat <laughs> GPT. Yeah. So productivity is the way you need to look at it. How can I be more productive and think of it as an intern or a junior assistant. You would always check their work. Don't just take it at face value. Mm -hmm. This conversation is amongst accountants, CPAs, bookkeepers, that they will become irrelevant, obsolete, however you want to do it, with AI. We know that AI chat GPT can now pass the bar exam. It can pass a CPA <laughs> qualification. It can certainly get a bookkeeping certification. So how do we all stay relevant in the years to come, Paul? Well, I mean, I think, you know, there's a couple of things. Obviously, it is going to shape and there will be places where businesses will look to, hey, can we reduce staff, right? I'd be, we'd be naive to think they won't look for those opportunities to boost profits. But I think if we're focusing on our soft skills, 
that communication, helping be strategic and figuring out how we can be more productive with the software, we'll be safe. We'll be fine. But if we bury our head in the sand and be like, well, oh, it will never impact me and I can just ignore it. I know what I'm doing. You know, you could be in for a surprise. Could it be tomorrow? Doubtful. Could it be next year? Probably doubtful as well. But somewhere in the future, they may say, hey, we can now go from five to three people and this person hasn't embraced it at all. So we're going to let them go and use these others that are taking advantage and being more productive with these tools. Got it. The fpnaguide.com, we'll put your contact details on our show notes, Paul, so people can reach out. But if they went along to your website, what would they see there? Tell us a, a bit about the kind of stuff you do. Yeah. So on the website, they'll see a couple of podcasts I run. I do one called FPNA Today. So do a weekly episode all about FPNA. I do one about financial modeling. You know, in addition to that, I have a number of different blogs out there. I have some of my courses. So I do quite a bit of corporate training. I have a best practice FPNA course a power query course I do. And then I have some corporate trainings as well. So they'll see a mix of different things. They'll also see resources of some of my favorite websites out there on finance. So my favorite podcasts beyond the ones I have, you know, just a lot of the common podcasts. And so there's a number of different resources, blogs and things to learn. There's some videos, some files they can download an FPNA resource guide. That's about 130 pages. And then there's also, which I'm actually in the process of refreshing, uh, third generation market guide. So last year we wrote about almost 20 tools in the market that are new in FPNA and told people about them and we're refreshing that guide this year. So that's also out there and and other things about the FPNA tool space and how to think about it because it's a very crowded space at the moment and a lot of people are overwhelmed. Well, it's wonderful what you're doing, Paul, to shine a light on the FPNA function, the whole business partnering thing. I know you're very much on a crusade to empower financial accounting professionals globally through all the stuff that you do. Leave us with an inspiring message, would you, Paul, to all the listeners and watchers to be more relevant, to be more influential, to master their skills and really make even more of a difference in the businesses of today going forward. Yeah, so there, there's two things I would say. One, focus on the needs of your business. Focus on how can you help your customer, whoever that is in the business, look good and accomplish their goals. And the second is learn the business. Nothing is more valuable in my mind from finance than understanding how the business works so you can have that seat at the table and bring value to the conversation versus, oh, that number looks wrong bank that you know yeah that's 10 cents off nobody cares <laughs> or whatever it might be Paul Barnhurst that's outstanding thank you so much for your passion and your insights today thank you Rob really enjoyed being on the show appreciate you having me 